Well, hi to everyone. Here we all are again. I hope you're enjoying your Sunday. I hope you're enjoying the service. I've loved the services over the last few weeks watching them. It's been just fantastic fun. Um, and my own heart's been really touched as I've watched and listened. And um, we're here again doing the story of George Muller, who, um, if you remember, was a man born about 200 years ago in what was then Prussia. It's become Germany now. Um, and he wasn't a Christian. He was a wild boy and an even wilder teenager. I don't know if you remember, he um, drank heavily, he gambled, he stole money. He ended up in a debtor's prison by the time he was 16 and his father had to come and rescue him. And he went to university where he continued with his crazy lifestyle, um, desperately searching for something he couldn't find. And he ends up in, in a prayer meeting uh, with his friend and he finds what he's been looking for. And I don't know if you remember, but God... We talked about how God began to melt his heart and change his heart. And he gave his whole life at that time to, to God. And he said, here's my life. You can do with my life what you want. And he felt after some years of having finished university that God was calling him to Great Britain, to London, to work amongst the poor. And he went there, uh, began this work among the poor. He was desperately... Um, distressed by the terrible conditions people were living in. Uh, if you remember at that time, um, uh, Britain was known as the workshop of the world. The Industrial Revolution had happened and all the people had piled into the cities and the factories and there were terrible living conditions. And he began this work among the, the poor in London, but he very quickly got sick. Um, and then do you remember God showed him that his heart wasn't quite as good as he thought it was, that actually his heart was lukewarm um, and not yet on fire for God. And he said at that time that Jesus showed him um, that he had died for his sins and he understood it more deeply. And he um, amazingly recovered from the illness that they thought he was dying from. He went down to Tynmouth in Devon and there he met with other people. And we told this story last week and his heart was touched. Uh, he began to read his Bible in a new way. He said it was like bread from heaven. He received the Holy Spirit uh, in a greater way in his life. And he said his heart was set on fire and for he was filled with joy and filled with zeal uh, to do God's work. And at that time, he stayed on in Tynmouth when, once he'd recovered from the illness. And he met two people who were to have a big part in his life. The first was a lady called Miss Mary Groves, who he married. She became his wife. Um, and the second was his great friend, who was his lifelong friend called Henry Craik. Got a picture of him. He looks a bit like a character from Dickens. But he became Muller's great friend. His, he was a spiritual man like Muller, interested only in serving God. So he stayed on down in Tynmouth, um, working with Craig, and um, he became the pastor. George Muller became the pastor of a chapel called Ebenezer Chapel. Um, and while he was there... Um, he was he was paid money and he discovered that the money came from the people putting paying for uh, a place in the church. And so the rich people gave lots of money and they sat at the front and the people with a bit of money sat in the middle. And then the very poor sat at the back because they couldn't give much money. And George Muller felt challenged by God at this time to not receive money in this way. He said, this is wrong, he said. So he got the equivalent of our red bucket and he put a box at the back of the church. And he said, if you want to give to us, you put your money in the box and we're going to trust that God will provide for us. And he began at that time, um, he said he, he, they began to learn to lean on the arm of Jesus um, and they began to pray to God for their food and for money and for provision and for rent for their home. Um, and God began to provide these things. And from that point onwards, he always spoke of God from then as the living God, the God who provided for him um, and gave to him all that he needed. And people would say to him, isn't it stressful? Isn't it uh, desperately worrying to be having to think, where's my food coming from? Where's my money going to come from? And he said, no, he said, the more we go on in this life of God providing for us, um, the greater joy we've known, the greater peace we've known. And he stayed for several years in Tynmouth. They become Christians, but in his heart, he knew God was calling him on to something new. And he got a letter from brother Craig, Henry Craig, who had moved to Bristol at that time. And he said to Muller, I think God wants us to start a work in the city of Bristol. 
and with me much weeping he left Tynmouth because the Christians didn't want him to go and he went to Bristol we've got a picture of the chapel where he and Craik began their work and in the very week when he arrived in Bristol in the 1830s that same week cholera arrived in Bristol it had been in London and cholera was a disease a bit like the coronavirus that was sweeping across the world but particularly uh, in Europe and in the UK and it had been in London and it reached Bristol at that time and Muller became very concerned about the poor again that he found in Bristol there were terrible living conditions uh, there was terrible overcrowding people did couldn't wash there wasn't water and this disease of cholera was it, it thrived where people were living in overcrowded conditions and there wasn't fresh water and um, he also be became concerned for the orphans that there were in Bristol because many of their parents had died because of the cholera and he talked to Christians at that time who said, we're so concerned, we, we're worried about money, we're worried about how we're going to survive. Um, and Muller said to them, you need to learn to trust in the living God. And they said, but we have to work for our living. And he said, we all have to work for our living. But as Christians, we all have the living God who will provide for us. And he doesn't leave us when things are difficult. They were worried about when they were going to be sick. If they got sick, they were worried about old age because there was no provision. <clears throat> but he said, God, uh, the living God who I know uh, will provide for us if we're praying to him and looking to him. And so he said to God, I want to start an orphanage and I want to start it for two reasons, to show the Christians that you are the living God, able to provide for all the needs of this orphanage. I don't want to send out appeals. I don't want to ask people for money. Lord, I want you to provide for it. And he said, the second reason is I want to care for these desperate children who had nowhere to go and no one to look after them at that time. Um, I want to start what he called an orphan house. He said, Lord, I need three things for my orphan house. I need a building. I need a thousand pounds, which is like about 50,000 pounds now. Um, and I need people. Um, I need people to come and help me run it. And he began to pray. And within, the, within a week of that prayer, all he'd got was the equivalent of two pounds and a large wardrobe that someone had given but over the following year and a half, as they prayed and they sought God and they asked him about it, people came round with tablecloths and they came round with beds and they came round with knives and forks and they must have stored this all somewhere. I don't know if they stored it in a warehouse or in the chapel, uh, but people came and they gave and then people started to come and say, we want to come and work with you. And then on April the 21st, 1836, the year before Queen Victoria became the Queen, um, he opened the orphanage and it was open. We've got a picture of it in a street called Wilson Street. I think it was number four Wilson Street. Um, and the provision was for girls and for little ones. Uh, we've got a picture of some of the children. They opened it with 17 orphans. Um, and on that day, he wrote in his diary at the end of the day, I've got what he actually wrote down. And it says this, uh, this day today was set apart for prayer and thanksgiving for the opening of our orphan house. This morning, several brothers prayed in the meeting time and Brother Craig spoke on some verses from Psalm 20. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. And in the afternoon, I spoke to the Sunday school children and to the orphans and to the other children who were present. And in the evening, we had another prayer meeting. We now have 17 children living in our orphan house and this was the next part of his story and you'll hear the next bit next week in part four uh let's pray lord jesus we want to know uh like muller knew more about how you have died for our sins we want to know this deeply in our hearts that you have come and you have died for our sins um, and we want you to work in our hearts like you worked in Muller's heart, how you came and you set his heart, his cold heart. Uh, you melted it, you changed it and you set him on fire. Um, and then, Lord, you had a work for him to do. I praise you that you have a work for us all to do. And we want to offer our lives more deeply to you at this time, this time of lockdown. We want to say, Jesus, here is my life again.
um, I want to give it to you again in a deeper way. Would you, would you use my life? Would you map out my future? Father, we pray for the children and the teenagers and those who are preparing for university. Would you map out a path, your path for them? Amen. Amen.